All right, crew. So tonight um, you'll be looking at a screencast that is um, going to be one of those fundamental screencasts that you likely will want to go back and look at again because so much of what we're going to be talking about this term depends on your full understanding of the few things I'm going to be talking about today. All right, so you can see here we're talking about the electron transport systems or also known as electron transport chains, and also something called the ATP cycle. But you can't actually understand these things without getting some fundamental background information before this. So let's hop into some concepts that you should be familiar with, but perhaps you need to have a little bit of a refresher. Imagine we have an atom, and you all know that atoms have a nucleus that contains protons and neutrons. Now I'm not going to show the neutrons here because they're not terribly important in terms of what we're going to be covering in biology. And then you have a whole bunch of electrons which are floating around in orbitals surrounding these nuclear cores. Okay, let me see, I have uh, five, six, seven, so I need to have seven electrons as well to be, make it a neutral atom. Okay, so you have the um, attractive forces of the protons holding in, holding on to those negatively charged electrons. Opposites attract. Um, and you also, I think, understand the concept that if you were to lose one of these electrons, let's say, for example, this electron decides to disappear and shoot out, that you're left with something called an ion when that electron leaves. And in this case, you have more positively charged bits and pieces than you have negatively charged bits and pieces. So as a result of that, you have a positively charged ion. Okay? Um, you could also have the exact same thing happen, but in reverse, where instead of having this electron leave, the electron, in fact, let's say it just sticks around and hangs out there, uh, but instead you have an electron that is released from something else that in fact goes up and joins up with this atom that was once neutral but now is no longer neutral because now you have one extra electron relative to the protons and therefore you're a positively charged ion or a cation. Okay? Now the other thing to keep in your brain is that there are, this is a case where an individual atom will become an, uh, an ion of some sort, but you actually can have molecules that can become charged, and we call those things polyatomic ions. And there's one very important polyatomic ion that you'll need to know, and that is the, the phosphate molecule. So let me go ahead, or phosphate ion, I should call it. Here you go. Uh, the one thing you should note associated with this phosphate polyatomic ion that it is a charged ion and it has a positive overall charge. Okay, so wait, phosphate. No, what am I smoking? It has a negative charge. It's a minus three charge associated with this phosphate group. Okay, you'll also notice here that I'm circling in blue here. That is a, uh, a bond that will attach itself to whatever larger molecule it's going to connect to. And it is a covalent bond. And you should know that covalent bonds are relatively strong bonds. And that bonds equal energy. And what I mean by that is if I were to snap that covalent bond, it would release a bucket load of energy that could be used to do something. That's going to be an important thing to consider as we look forward to what we're going to be talking about. Okay, so, uh, and, and understand that this polyatomic ion is no different than having a monatomic ion, except that you have a lot more atoms involved. But you're still losing or gaining an electron. In this case, you're going to be gaining a whole bunch of electrons uh, for it to become a negative three charged uh, polyatomic ion. Okay, so now let me talk about one more concept before I run off and have my lunch, and that is the concept of reduction versus oxidation. Now, many people have probably heard of the word oxidation, even if you never took chemistry. 
Uh, for example, iron oxidizes and turns into rust. But what you probably don't know is that these terms have very specific meanings in chemistry and biochemistry. Reduction is the gaining of an electron. Could be multiple electrons, but let's just say it's gaining of an electron. And if you gain an electron, don't forget that you become negatively charged because you have more negative charges than you do the positive charges. And then oxidation is just the opposite. It's the loss of an electron. And in oxidation, when you lose the electrons, you become a positively charged species or a cation. Now, you can't have reduction without oxidation, and you can't have oxidation without reduction because you have to get the electron from something or you have to lose the electron to something in that process. And as a result of that, we refer to this as being simply a redox reaction whenever you have an oxidation-reduction reaction. Redox, obviously short for reduction-oxidation. One way in which you should, um, you could really help yourself to remember the, um, what reduction and oxidation is, is this mnemonic oil rig oil rig and oil rig is oxidation is loss rig is reduction is gaining okay so hopefully that'll help you to remember it all right so those are some fundamentals now we have the idea of an atom with its electrons and protons the idea of what a an ion is and now we understand that there are these reactions called reduction and oxidation reactions and fundamentally what you should know is that these oxidation and reduction reactions that happen inside of living organisms are the fundamental basis for all metabolic activities that happen inside the cells of those organisms. All right, I'm going to go eat. Okay, I'm back after lunch. Um, so let's first talk about the concept of the electron transport system. And you should also know that this is sometimes known as the electron transport chain. Okay, So you'll see it interchangeably. I'm sure that there are going to be other members of the, uh, the faculty who call it an electron transport chain. It doesn't make a difference what you call it. In fact, I even might call it electron transport chain. It's the same exact concept. And um, it's a pretty complex thing, but I'm going to greatly simplify this just so we can be sure that you understand fundamentally what's going on. I want you to imagine there's a molecule here, and I'm just drawing it as a squiggly thing because it really doesn't make a difference what's going on here. But this molecule has an atom associated with it that loses, somehow, an electron. Okay, so what does that mean? Oxidation is happening because an electron is shooting off of that molecule. Now, keep in mind that if you've somehow launched an electron and there's not a, uh, something to receive it, that means that you've had to put some energy into this molecule, this black molecule here. So somehow, and I'm just going to show this with a red lightning bolt, that molecule received some energy, and that energy led to the release of an electron. Now, remember how I said before that you can't have um, an oxidation without a reduction event? Well, eventually you're going to see that there's going to be a reduction event, but it'll happen later on. Know right now that there's not something hanging out here immediately to take that electron away from that molecule. So that means that molecule had to lose its electron through other means, meaning that it had to be pushed out rather than drawn out by something that's going to receive it. Okay. So we have this high-powered electron that goes cruising out. And then this electron essentially gets channeled. And I'm showing that with sort of a funnel-like thing. That's pretty lousy, though, actually. Let me, let me try that again. Jeez. Brutal. OK, so here's the funnel. Oh, that's much better. OK, so the electron then, which is a high-energy electron, will dump into this funnel. Now, the electron transport system is not really like this, but I'm going to make it a metaphor just because it makes it a lot simpler to understand what's going on. So imagine you have here a set of stairs. Now, actually, no, let me back up and, and do this a, a different way. I want you to imagine that you have a ramp below that funnel. 
And at the very base of this thing, you have, I don't know, let, let's just say we have a small child hanging out here, okay? I'm not sure how that's a child, but let's pretend. There we go. There's his feet and its legs. All right, so here you have a small child at the bottom of this thing, something that's very vulnerable. Um, that's really awful that I've decided to make this a child, but it, it'll make sense in just a moment. And this electron comes out of that molecule, and it goes through that funnel, and it goes sliding right down this ramp and slams into this child, okay? Now, obviously, that's a bad situation because that child's going to get hurt, hit by that electron, like a, getting hit by a 95-mile-per-hour uh, fastball. So uh, you really want to make sure that you don't make all the energy go into that child at the very bottom, okay? Because it's not going to turn out well. So what you need to do, actually, is something very different. So let me go to this next thing here. And I want you to imagine, again, we still have the electron that's come flying out of there, and it's a high-energy electron. Imagine instead of having just a, an inclined plane, you have a set of steps. And this is exactly what the electron transport system is. It acts in some ways like a set of steps. And it's a set of steps for the electron. Because the electron will go down, and then successfully, uh, successively, it'll go down each individual step until it gets to the very bottom. Now, at the bottom, because this is all about energy here, you have low energy. Okay, so this... Ooh, nice spelling there. I get an R in there somewhere. That electron is low energy at the bottom, whereas it's high energy... That's a G, by the way. Nice, huh? High energy at the top. So it goes cruising down these steps, and by the time it gets to the bottom, it's low energy. So if you had that same little baby down here hanging out, right, it's not going to get hurt because the energy of the electron is so low at that point that it's just going to sort of knock off the thing's diaper and then she won't even notice what has hit her. So the only reason that that can possibly be the case, however, is at each successive step down, you release a little bit of that energy from that electron, okay? So this is capital E, meaning energy, being released at each one of these steps. And the reason why this is an important concept to understand is that you want to ultimately, if you're a, a biological organism or an organism, you want to be able to control the release of that energy. It's in much the same way, like, you don't want... You, you could easily take your, um, the gasoline that's powering the car and you could light it on fire all at once and it would explode in a huge event, right? Which would probably destroy your car at the same time. You want to control the, uh, the explosion. And that's exactly what you do. Your engine is basically, the combustion engine is about controlling the gasoline that's in the tank in the car, controlling the explosion so that it releases the energy in a useful way and it can use that energy to propel the car forward, okay? Well, that's exactly what's gonna happen. An electron transport system is a whole bunch of molecules, proteins, um, complex lipids, even carbos in some cases, that slow down that electron and tap into that electron's energy and release it so that work can be done. So all this energy that's being released here is being used to do some form of work. And that work can be any number of things, as you'll come to see. Okay? But it's going to be work. So the electron transport system is critical for taking a high-energy electron, slowly releasing the energy out of that high-energy electron to do some form of work. Okay. So, let's now move into a different concept. And that is the concept of... What are we doing? Oh, yeah. Let, let's go back to the... Uh, to ATP and um, the phosphate molecule. Let me see if I can add this in here. Ah, there we go. Good. So here we have an ATP molecule. ATP means adenosine triphosphate. And this area that I'm circling here in pink, that is your adenosine. Adenosine is a combination of adenine, which is a nitrogen base. You don't really need to know that. Uh, and ribose, which is a sugar. 
Okay, so those two things together make up adenosine. And then you have these three phosphate groups here, which uh, we've talked about moments ago. So an ATP molecule, adenosine triphosphate, tri meaning three, is a high energy molecule. Let me just undo those two circles here. So ATP equals high energy. Higher energy than that electron I was just talking about that was rolling down these steps. Okay, so there, it contains, it's an energy storage molecule that's going to be very easy to use by the cell. A lot of times we call it the, uh, the energy currency of the cell in much the same way that a dollar bill as opposed to a hundred dollar bill is going to be the energy currency or the, the currency that you would use to get um, a Snapple out of a Snapple machine or something like that. Although that costs more than a buck usually. But you know what I'm saying there. It, 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 you want to be able to break up a large bill into smaller bills and the smaller bills are the ATP molecules um, that the cell will actually use to fuel all sorts of activities that are going on inside the cell, including one that you already know about, which is membrane transport. Okay, so this ATP is an interesting thing because um, the phosphate that is associated with the ATP, this last one here that I'm circling in blue, it can snap off. Relatively easily it can snap off, and when it does that, it releases energy, and that's the energy that's going to be used to uh, fuel whatever cell activity is going on here. Okay, So break off that last phosphate, and you release energy. But of course, if you break off that last phosphate, you no longer are an adenosine triphosphate, you're an adenosine diphosphate, or with only two phosphate groups hanging out there. And that's what brings us to this next little diagram that I'm going to show you which shows ATP in its high energy state at the top. And then we show the release of a phosphate group. So I'm going to do PO4 three minus release. As a result of that PO4 three minus release, that phosphate release, you also are going to have energy released Okay. And then as a result of that, you no longer have ATP, you have ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and that is low energy, and that's why it doesn't have the nice starburst around it the way I have the starburst around the ATP. Now, think of that as sort of like a uh, rechargeable battery. Um, you have your rechargeable battery on your iPad fully charged, and then over the course of the day, it slowly releases its energy in order to... to uh, allow you to use your iPad, and at the end of the day, you're down to 10% or whatever it is. You don't have much energy left in your iPad. And then you plug it in, and when you plug it in, you can recharge it right back up to being an ATP again. And, of course, if this is the case, you need to actually have not energy release, but you need energy input in order to do this. Plus, you do need a PO4, because remember, that was what was released, so you need to have a PO4 input, and once you do that, then you can return back to being an ATP. So obviously, this is a cycle. But what is it that is this pink arrow? And that's what is an important thing, because we're going to find out what that pink arrow is all about. What is it that drives the process of making ATP from ADP plus a phosphate group. All right? And in fact, there are two ways in which this is done. They're both called phosphorylation, which makes sense because it's a phosphate group. So phosphorylation, the fancy word for attaching a phosphate. So if we go back and take a look at our phosphate here, where are we? All right? We want to attach one of these things to an ADP molecule. That's called phosphorylation. Right? And phosphorylation can be done in one of two ways. We have electron transport phosphorylation. And remember how I said not too long ago that there's work that gets done 
when you do this when you send an electron through an electron transport system well that's going to be very much involved in the process of attaching a phosphate group to an ADP molecule to make an ATP so we have electron transport phosphorylation but then we also have one called substrate which is any sort of molecule substrate level phosphorylation Ooh, I left out an H there okay so those are the two forms of um, ways in which we charge an ADP, ADP molecule back up to being an ATP molecule and we're gonna go into the significant details of these two things in a later screencast Whoa, this is a long one okay uh, I will see you tomorrow bye